All right, Jen, are you ready for part two? Yes. All right. So thank you for your questions. Let's go ahead and get them up on the screen here. So again, slido.com 789. We're monitoring on our phones. I'm going to throw on a 20 minute timer this time. 20 minute we timer, perfect. Carved out a little more time in the service today. So that'll be our five minute warning. Okay. Slido. So there's a lot of good questions here, Jen. Okay. And I'm thinking, let's start off with something we actually talk a lot about in the Bible study that I lead every Sunday which is how do we get past the misogyny in the Bible? Yep. So we've got polygamy, handmaids, mothers omitted from genealogy. Today we're talking about how anything that goes wrong is the woman that's blamed. Right. So how can we get past the misogyny and still hear God's voice in the text? That's a great question. Do you want to go first? <laughs> All right. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it actually relates to another question that someone raised in Bible study today, Jen, that okay. they wanted to talk about today, which is just what is our view of Scripture in terms of these ideas of inerrancy or infallibility? And so you've probably heard these words before of inerrancy or infallibility. So the idea being that Scripture is literally true in all of its words, even if it's making a scientific claim. So anything that it says would be literally true. And that's definitely not how the two of us understand scripture. I think when you get yourself into this, this attempt to read scripture very literally or a fundamentalist perspective, it is so easy to get yourself into trouble because you find yourself trying to justify or explain away a lot of really problematic texts in scripture. But if you open yourself up to understanding the process of how scripture was written and how the Bible was formed, it just gets you into this space where you can have a much broader understanding of the text that I think is really helpful. And so we understand scripture to be what it is, that it is a human document that people were writing about their experiences of God, doing their best like all of us to try to understand who God is, and they were writing those experiences down as a community, and later they were forming scripture. So a lot of the Old Testament was put together during the time of exile when the Israelites went into Babylon, and they were afraid that their faith was going to be destroyed. And so they took their oral traditions and they put them down onto papyrus to preserve them, to say, we need to hold on to these stories and to these words. But we have to understand scripture for what it is, that there are human influences in the text, that humans are trying to understand who God is. And that scripture is made up of so many different genres. The people who are writing the book of Genesis, for example, they know that those first 11 chapters are meant to be folklore and mythology. They're not sitting down to write a scientific text of exactly how the world was formed in seven days a couple thousand years ago. That's not even in their understanding or mind. And so when we do a little bit of literary criticism or source criticism, these are just kind of scholarly biblical words where we have to study scripture as a text and to know how it was formed and what the genres are, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so that's how you and I approach scripture. You know, uh, the idea of scripture being inerrant or infallible is often defended using a verse from um, a letter to Timothy where it says all scripture is God breathed. And that term God breathed is actually the only time that word is ever used in Greek literature anywhere. The word was made up for that text. And the basis of the word, it's just kind of a portmanteau, a smashing together of two different words, one for God and one for breath or spirit. And I think that when we read scripture, I do think that the spirit of God is with us, guiding us, helping us to understand. That's why when we read problematic texts where there's misogyny baked in, I think the spirit within us says, this isn't quite right. This doesn't make sense. This can't really be what God wants for us. And then when we read text where kind of the, the love of Christ or even the love of God in the Old Testament is woven through the text and we read that and we say, this is the picture of God that I understand. I think that the Spirit is moving through us. 
Not that God is taking someone's hand and holding their, um, their quill to a scroll as they write, but instead that the Spirit is moving within us to use these sacred scriptures that the church has historically said are useful for our faith and we can extract from it. So, let me get to the actual question. <laughs> you can't put two pastors on a chair and expect them to get through very many questions. Um, the misogyny. Oh, man, it's problematic. So in our Bible study, we joke all the time that we could spend our entire hour talking about the misogyny in the text every single week. And it's the same reason why there's so much violence in the Old Testament scriptures as well, attributed to God. We have to understand the ancient Near East, the milieu in which the Old Testament scriptures are being written, and to know that within this culture, at this time, that there was the patriarchy very alive and well, and that women were not elevated or respected or listened to or given a voice, and that these Israelites, just like the other cultures around them, would think that God was with them if they won their wars. And so they would go into battle saying God is on our side and justify the violence they perpetuated by saying that God ordained it. This is what those cultures did. And so we can't read it and think that the God we understand, the God of all time, is supporting this violence or supporting this misogyny. We have to understand the context that it comes from and the patriarchy that it comes from which makes it really beautiful when the text has these subversive stories of women leaders and women in the genealogy of Jesus, etc. Did I leave anything? No, that was an amazing answer. I would have I would have said the same thing. I would just add that I I also interpret Jesus as, you know, God in the flesh and his actions and words speak volumes to what I think we understand God intended for humanity. It's doing it again, I think. I'm going to grab me that other mic. Um, and Jesus, I always say, was a feminist or a proto-feminist. So he has these great stories like talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, who's not only a woman, but a woman of Samaria who, you know, are enemies with Jesus' people. And so he, he definitely uh, subverts boundaries. He crosses boundaries. And women are very much a part of his ministry. Here we go. There's no distinction for him between... Um, men and women and, and their importance and their value and their worth. Uh, and then we also have these stories of that the women at the cross are the ones who follow Jesus all the way to the end when all of his male disciples abandoned him. The biblical writers wanted us to know that, and they want us to know that the first witnesses to the resurrection and, and the women who are at the tomb are women. So it's very important that th there are these threads that cut through this wider culture that was very misogynistic and had a lot of anti-feminist um, happenings, there are these really important threads that are woven through that the, the, our ancestors wanted us to know there was this importance of women that Jesus himself lifted up and valued. Yeah, women weren't allowed to be eyewitness testimony, and yet the first witnesses, the resurrection, are women, and so it is so subversive to say, hey, you want to follow this Jesus guy? Well, then you've got to listen to the women, because no one else is, and that's pretty radical. And so I think that as we think about the, the question said, how can we hear God's voice, is that God is in that text pushing back against these cultural mores and to say there's something bigger going on here that involves the people you think are weak, that you shouldn't listen to, that aren't relevant, because guess what? God's working through them. And so that's how we can hear God's voice in the text. Yeah, absolutely. All right, that's another like one? That's like half our time already, but okay, okay. let's keep going. We're going to get to at least four this week. I hope I so. I promise. We'll try. All right. We've got several of the age-old question here. Why do bad things happen to good people? Yeah, that's a great question. I was waiting for that question to come up. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So there's this whole, well, why don't you start? Because we had talked about this one for maybe doing a digital devotion about it. But did you want to share some of your thoughts first? And then I'll jump in. Yeah, definitely. So... This is, this is the question of theodicy. Um, how is it that God's justice can be real in the midst of human suffering? And so for a lot of people, this is a really problematic, difficult question. It makes people wonder how God can even exist to see so much evil in the world. 
And so for me, theologically or philosophically, the way that I've always answered it that's made a lot of sense to me personally is that this concept of free will. As humanity, we are capable of creating such beauty in this world. We have seen incredible human kindness. We have seen artwork and poetry that moves our souls human bonds and connection and love and all of that beauty is so incredible and we have the choice and ability to create through that beauty and the corollary to that is we also have the capacity for evil to choose not to create beauty to choose to harm our fellow human being i think that is a reality that is part of free will is that with the beauty we have the capacity for evil all of us and so I think the question is a little flawed because what does a good person mean that gets you into a lot of trouble when you think you've got good people and bad people because we all have the capacity for mistakes and sin. Um, But then you have like, why do natural disasters happen or why are there car crashes or why does disease take someone's life before we're ready? Um, And again, just within this natural universe in which we exist, if God were able to stop or prevent all of that from happening, we just really wouldn't live in a very sensical world. It would mean that any time someone tried to stab another person, for example, well then the blade of the knife would have to turn to rubber so that it bounced off that human's flesh. Or that when a car crash happened, the cars would have to somehow create this car-wide airbag that cushioned everybody from the impact. Um, Or that tumors could magically disappear. That's just not the reality of the world that we live in. And so the natural processes of the world involve disease and disaster, which can be human created through our choices. Um, and so that's, that answers the question for me. I don't know if it's satisfactory for everyone, but this idea of free will. There's actually also this idea that while God is all powerful, that God limits God's self because of free will, so that God actually can't stop human free will, that God self-limits in that way, that's getting into some deep theology. So if anyone wants to dig into that, we can talk more about that later. But all that to say, I think we have the capacity for good and evil, and that the natural universe we live in is, is not one in which um, there's disease or disasters or mistakes or accidents. Yeah. Again, I would say the same thing. I would also add that um, for me personally, I, I like the idea that although I don't, I don't think God causes suffering, I definitely think that that's just a part of this world that we're in and its brokenness. I do think that there are a lot of opportunities in the midst of tragedy and suffering for us to grow spiritually, whether we are the person who is suffering or whether we're the caretaker of someone who's suffering. I think there there is an opportunity there for deep soul searching and deep soul growth. Um, And I would also say that this is a question that our ancestors have been wrestling with since the beginning of time. So the entire book of Job is this question. Job is this blameless, wonderful person, and yet disaster befalls him. And the story, which is understood by biblical scholars to be like a myth, or, you know, it's not a real story. It's in a, it takes place in a, an imaginary land called ooze. Um, God and the devil, like, make a pact. They're going to play a game with Job. And the devil's like, I bet if you cause a lot of suffering, Job will not praise you anymore. And God's like, I think he will. And then they, like, roll some dice and, like, decide to figure this out. And they keep, you know, taking things from Job, his family, his house, his livestock, all of this thing. And Job continues to praise God. And all of his friends on earth are saying, you know, this is terrible. How can you praise a God? How can you believe in a God? that would do these terrible things to you. And Job just continues to say, it's not up to me what happens to me in my life. It's only up to me how I choose to respond to these things. So I take it that through that story, our ancestors have been struggling with this question also and trying to find ways to coach themselves through hard times of themselves and their friends and say, we can't, we can't know what's going to happen to us. We can't control the disasters that come our way, but we can control how we respond to them, and and how we orient our hearts in the midst of disaster. The Bible has several different answers to this question, and I think that is really powerful to know that it's okay to hold this intention. It's part of the mystery of faith. Scripture is very comfortable with 
mystery and ambiguity and different answers to the same question. And so it's something that we wrestle with. All right, you want me to bring up another one? Yeah, or you let's got do one? another one. Um, we have two questions on prayer. Okay. How does God decide what prayers to answer? Someone else asked, how do you keep praying even through difficult moments? Yeah, so prayer is a, is a tricky thing because I think we have different examples in the Bible of people who are praying. Um, some of those prayers, like when Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you, that seems to suggest that it's a transaction between us and God, that if we pray for something, we are asking for something, and that if we do it long enough or hard enough, that God will grant us this wish, like a genie. Um, but we have other examples, like the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. You know, we, we interpret that, our Father, you know, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That prayer is much more of a conversation between humans and God, and it's, again, about reorienting our hearts. It talks about, you know, not my will be done, but your will be done on earth here, the way it is in heaven, the spiritual realm. And so I interpret those as two different types of prayer, and, and I think the first one where, you know, ask and you shall receive is more about um, trying to understand the will of God in our lives, and it kind of ties to that other question about, you know, we often pray that prayer, those types of prayers, when we're in the middle of a hard time or in the middle of a disaster or tragedy. We're asking God to do something on our behalf, or we're interceding for someone else to ask for, you know, healing or something for this other person. The other type of prayer is a daily reminder that God is... Um, you know, it's not a transaction, but it's a relationship. And so if I try and do your will and, um, you know, if you help me resist temptation and give me what I need for the day, then I'll, I will continue to, you know, try and live out your teachings. And so it's more of a relational prayer. I think both are valid. I think um, it's difficult to try. It's, it's not healthy, perhaps, to only ever have the first type of prayer in your life where you're only ever asking God for things because what kind of a relationship is that? No one likes a relationship with another person like that, right? But if it's a conversation and it's an ongoing spiritual practice where you're trying to connect with the Spirit and figure out what is God speaking into my life today? What is God, you know, what is the Spirit guiding me to do today? How can I, you know, sort of refresh my, my life and my heart today to bring more grace into it and to share more grace with the world. I think that's a much healthier way to incorporate prayer into our lives. Yeah, definitely. That prayer is, I love this verse um, that we should pray without ceasing. And that seems really difficult to do, but I think it helps us understand prayer in a new way where our life itself is a prayer that the fact that we're going through the world and we're living and breathing and interacting with everything around it can be its own form of prayer. And that when that happens, the prayer is less about asking for a request to be granted. Um, and that's when we get, that's when it gets really problematic talking with families where they've been praying every day for a child to be healed of a disease and it doesn't happen and they wonder do I not have enough faith and if I just had enough faith would it come to pass and that is a really tragic moment a really tragic scenario and I don't think that prayer is meant to ask for something and then receive it but instead it is a way for us to kind of be in the presence of God and have God shape our own posture and our own being in the world Anne Lamott, who maybe some of you read her book during the recent book group, but she has a book called Help Thanks Wow, that if we want to know what to pray, we can just pray for some help, give God thanks, and just say wow at everything we see around us. And so that can kind of be a way to guide us into some very simple prayers. Help Thanks Wow. I like it. All right, we got time for a fourth. We okay. are better than last I'm week. I'm very proud of us. Uh, do you have one in mind? No, go ahead. Okay, I, I was interested in this one by Poetry Fan. Four minutes ago they asked, how do you see the Bible in the context of so many other me meaningful spiritual texts? Oh. For example, why do we still study the Bible when Mary Oliver poems exist? <laughs> that is such a valid question. Uh, well, I would say to that that Mary Oliver poems would not exist if it weren't for texts like the Bible because the Bible is one of the oldest texts in the world. Um, alongside, there's a Buddhist text, I think it's called the Diamond Sutra, um, we have the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are a couple of other ancient texts, and 
all of our you know, myths and our stories and our imagery of how we understand the world come from these original texts and the way that our ancestors describe them and the evolution, the way that, you know, the evolution of literature is that everything builds upon other stories and um, myths and narratives and they're reformed and they're twisted and they're changed and that's how the history of literature has evolved. And so I would argue that all of our favorite modern day poets are taking from, they're standing on the shoulders of giants who had these amazing, I mean, the Bible is full of beautiful poetry, right? And so I think so much of that is the foundation of how we can uh, appreciate what's being created today. And that would go for art as well. Yeah, definitely. And I have this like two part lecture I've done before on how the canon of the Bible is, was formed. And so I can give that again sometime. But, you know, these early Christians were looking to what texts they felt were universal that churches all over from different parts of the world were using that they felt were instructive about the experiences of God and so they formed this canon but honestly if we were to open the canon again and say where do we feel that there are texts that are instructive to us about the character of God that are universal we all feel that they're meaningful in parts of the world um, across the globe I bet that there we would find a few other texts. When you have these conversations with people, they always point to something like Letter from a Birmingham Jail by Dr. King, that these texts can be as instructive as Scripture. Now, historically, traditionally, as the Christian faith, we have this closed canon of Scripture. It's part of our tradition that when we preach, we preach from Scripture. But there are so many beautiful texts that can be just as illuminating, and it's okay for us to see and experience God within these other texts outside of Scripture as well, because God God is working in people throughout all of human history in their writings, in their poetry, et cetera. Yeah. And I would also add, so Jacob and I are big fans of interfaith um, communications, interfaith relationships, and interfaith work. And I think there's so much beauty and power in celebrating our neighbors' religions and their spiritual texts and seeing where ours converge and where they diverge. I don't think that there's any... Um, negativity or anything dangerous about incorporating some of that into our own spirituality. My own story is that my, my grandparents on my mother's side were Buddhist, and they were converted to Christianity through Christian missionaries in Korea at some point in their young adult lives. And um, so I asked them once, like, what was that like? Like, how did you just completely set aside this ancient tradition that your ancestors and your family had worshipped for you know, generations and start this whole new religion just based on these random people that came knocking on your door. And my grandma was like, oh, I think it's all the same. <laughs> it's all about love. It's all about following, you know, the, the patterns of teachers who have gone before us who are teaching us how to be good to one another and how to care for one another and how to, to live la love in our lives. I'm like, oh, okay. So uh, I heard it once said by um, an interfaith work uh, specialist named Ibu Patel that it's sort of like if faith is a mountain there are many different paths to get up the mountain. We're all just trying to summit together to find this concept of enlightenment or heaven or, or love. And so there's nothing wrong about looking at other paths and figuring out how um, what, what's working for that person getting up the mountain and what's not working for me and what, what is working for me that I could share with someone else who's struggling up the mountain. Yeah, and within our Christian tradition, like we very much believe in the role of Christ as this redeemer. Um, and at the same time, it would be foolish of us to think that God isn't revealing God's truths and love in any path or any religion. And so that is why interfaith dialogue is so important. Yeah, and you had referenced last week this book that Jacob and I both really like by Rob Bell, an author and speaker that we enjoy. And he, he, it's called Love Wins. And um, someone had, the, the book was sort of spurred on for him by this conversation he had, or no, it was a, an art project, I think, where they had hung um, pictures of spiritual influencers that they felt were important to the world and the history of the world around this room, and everybody went and, like, um, I think wrote notes on it or something, and someone wrote on a picture, was it Gandhi? Um, this is crazy. He's, he's definitely going to hell. And Rob Bell was like, I'm sorry, if you think Gandhi's going to hell, we have like a much deeper conversation that needs to happen here. Like, on what grounds would you say that Gandhi is going to hell? It's simply because he didn't profess faith in Jesus Christ. That seems really trivial when you look at the, the breadth and the depth of the life of this man's work. So I think that's kind of where the conversation of interfaith starts. Yeah. And uh, we already filmed this coming Friday's Digital Devotion. So get ready for answering the question. Of hell. Of hell, yeah. <laughs> So 
Um, all right, I think our time is up. I right think then. our time is up. Is there anything else that's burning, or can we do some digital devotions in the yeah, future we'll with these? Yeah, we'll keep talking about these, and if you submitted a question we didn't get to, we would love to chat with you about it. Send us an email, catch us after a service sometime. We would love to continue the dialogue. This was really fun and just good to know what you all are thinking about. Yeah. I think there's some really important questions we need to keep addressing in there. Definitely. All right. Thanks, everyone. And so as the choir comes up, what were you going to say? I was going to say, as the choir comes up, one easy question we can knock out. David, someone asked, how can I join the choir? <laughs> so you should answer that as you get ready to sing. If you'd like to be a part of this wonderful choir, we rehearse after the service, 15 minutes after the postlude ends in the choir room, which is back there. If you have a lot of musical and singing experience, it's a great group for you. If you don't, it's also a great group for you. We will ease you in. We've got lots of great leaders of various kinds to help with that. And it's a wonderful group. You can come talk to me or talk to Alex about it, and we can tell you more. If you've been enjoying watching these, these uh, bells being rung by our, gr our great uh, choral bells, as well as our visitors from from Hollywood. Um, the R Ensemble meets on Mondays at 7 p.m. over in the bell room uh, across the way, and you can email me for more information about that as well. So lots of great musical opportunities. My email is on the back of the bulletin, and always happy to talk and uh, offer suggestions and guidance. <laughs>